I don't know if any of you have noticed, but the last few years have been wild for airline travel. It seems like not even a week can pass before a new viral video was circulating the internet, showcasing some idiot on a plane or airport screaming, shouting, or even starting fights with other passengers and flight staff for no apparent reason. I'm sure it's entertaining when you're sitting at home and come across these videos while casually scrolling through Reddit or Twitter. You might laugh, or shake your head at the stupidity and not give it a second thought. Unfortunately, this isn't an option when you're the one on the job. I can't even count the number of times I've had to call security to deal with a rowdy or straight-up violent customer in the airport over the last couple of years. Most of the time, the things that set people off are surprisingly minor and unavoidable issues. They want to board now, but it isn't their turn, so they start harassing me and my co-workers. Another passenger looked at them funny, so they get into a screaming match. A baby is crying, so the grown adult starts whining even louder. The person in front of them took the last chocolate donut with sprinkles from the airport bakery, so they start throwing punches. You would not believe the stuff I've seen. Needless to say, I got tired of it. Getting up to go to work, wondering what kind of unhinged maniac was going to make a problem for me, lost its appeal. So I started to look for a new job. A few weeks into the job search, I began to get doubtful that I would find a suitable replacement. Seeing as my only tangible skills and experience were in the airline industry, I didn't have much more than other airline jobs within realistic reach. Though I didn't have a problem with relocation, if it meant I was going to end up in another major airport, I had no interest. During one 3 a.m. job search after my long shift at the airport, running on nothing but the jittery movements from the room temperature coffee, I found a new job listing. One Pine Airport, a rural airport in the Midwest. I sat up and took another sip of coffee. The pictures for the place gave an idea of the size, and it looked tiny. Only a couple of runways, a single terminal, and a cute internal design reflective of the forestry that surrounded it. Perfect for me, I thought. I imagined there would not be nearly as many people to deal with. I scrolled down to the job details, and to my relief, it was for the exact same job I had already been doing. The only difference was that it required frequent night shifts. I had done plenty of night shifts before, but doing a few more of them made no difference to me. Surprisingly listed was the pay. I couldn't believe my eyes. They were offering more starting than I was being paid at the airport I had been at for over three years. Now wide awake, I eagerly uploaded my resume filled out all the application questions, and even spent the next hour crafting an unnecessary cover letter. I headed to bed with the hopes that my days at overflowing airports might be over. The next day, as I was getting ready for work, I opened my phone to scroll through notifications and check emails. To my disbelief, I had one from the job I had applied for only hours earlier. The manager at the airport, who had posted the job, requested an interview over Zoom. I quickly replied, and we settled on a time during my lunch break the very next day. The first few hours of work breezed by, and I boarded flight after flight of passengers. I couldn't help but think about the upcoming interview. When it came time, I was nervous as hell, but my fears were diffused within the first minute. A bald, well-kept, and well-dressed man joined the meeting room and greeted me with a warm smile. He introduced himself as James. I couldn't have asked for a more friendly interviewer. He welcomed me, and after some small talk and a few questions about my relevant experience, he gave an overview of the job's details. That being the same job I already had with better pay and more frequent night shifts. No problem with me. After affirming that I knew all the details of the job, James cracked another wide, friendly smile and asked an unexpected question. When can you start? I spit the sip of coffee I had just taken back into the cup. I looked up at James and tried to find the right words, but I was unprepared. You, uh, aren't going to give me a call back later or something? Don't you have more interviews and paperwork waiting to clear and... James waved his hand dismissively at his webcam. You're the only applicant we have, and we couldn't have asked for a better one. As for the paperwork and such, we'll figure that out when we figure it out. The job is yours. Whenever you can start, that is. Uh, preferably soon. Though the feelings of shock and confusion remained, 
They were pushed to the side by my excitement. Throughout the remainder of our conversation, James and I reviewed our schedules and set up a start date before ending the call. I sat back in my break room chair with a sigh of disbelief and a chuckle. I am well aware that it is standard to give at least two weeks notice to your current employer, and moving across states for a job is supposed to take quite a bit of planning, but I was dying to get out of my current job. Through both eagerness and maybe a little stupidity, we settled on a day only a little over a week away. At the end of my shift that day, I let my manager know I had to be done in a week. Though she wasn't happy, she assured me it wouldn't be a problem. My final day was nothing short of horrendous. A couple had come up, demanding and screaming that I refund their tickets for no apparent reason. On top of that, they still wanted to fly. After hearing that no, they would not be able to fly for zero cost, the husband, followed by the wife, both started shouting threats. Security was quickly called to the terminal. As soon as they arrived, I checked my watch to find that my shift was over. I let out a sigh of relief and excitedly walked away. As deprived of sleep as I was, with a long and undoubtedly stressful drive ahead of me, I was still more energetic and in higher spirits than I'd been in a long time. Surprisingly, the drive went off without a hitch. I arrived earlier than expected and checked into the motel room I rented for the week, so I had time to get the move figured out. After dumping a few boxes of personal items and a suitcase of clothes into the room, I turned off the lights. I passed out as soon as my head hit the pillow. I energetically awoke that evening to prepare myself for my first shift. I quickly got dressed and started the drive in hopes of arriving plenty early. Naively, I hadn't considered how my unfamiliarity with the roads would slow me down, and after a staggering amount of wrong turns, I arrived at the airport with only minutes to spare. The airport was even smaller in person than I had imagined it to be from the pictures. I quickly walked through the entrance and was greeted by the small team of security. After notifying them that I was there for work and that James had been waiting for me, they hurried me through without so much as a question. The security, the architecture, the beautiful scenery that surrounded it. Nothing about this airport could have felt more welcoming. I walked through to find a single terminal inside, devoid of any passengers, with James sitting behind a counter at the end. After a moment, he looked up, and upon making eye contact with me, his tired face lit up. I was about to apologize for my tardiness, but didn't have the chance as he rushed to show me the employee locker room where he had my new employee uniform and badge waiting inside my very own locker. He told me to get changed and to meet him outside right away. I did as he asked, and within a couple of minutes, I walked out to find him back behind the console at the counter, gathering his belongings. He noticed me approaching and glanced up, thanking me for showing up and starting so soon, as he handed me a fresh cup of coffee. He also apologized for not being able to stick around long for my shift, but he sounded sure that he wasn't all that worried. I have to be going now. I've been on duty for 17 hours. I know you're plenty familiar with our systems and software. You know what you're doing. He assured me with a pat on the back before walking out from the desk. He turned and added, It'll be a quiet night for you anyways. Uh, no flight scheduled. Just sit back, relax, and... Oh, yeah. Uh, most importantly, I nearly forgot. He reached into his bag and pulled out a single sheet of laminated paper and held it in front of me. Give this a read as soon as you can. Go over it a few times if you need. Don't deviate from it. I took it, but before I could even get a look, I noticed James begin to walk toward the exit along with every single one of the security guards and the cashier, who had just closed down the only shop in the airport. I then noticed that all of the scanners and metal detectors at the security gate were shut off. I started to panic. Hey, James, where's everyone going? I shouted. The first words I had managed to speak to my new boss since arriving. He stopped and turned back again. Oh, yeah. Another thing I ought to mention... Uh, everyone except whoever's working the night shift in, well, your position, takes off right around now. Uh, don't worry, security will be back around 5 a.m. You got this place to yourself. Grab a magazine from the little store in there if you get bored. Feel free to snag yourself a couple snacks, too. He began to walk away again before briefly turning and pointing at me. But before you do anything, read that list. You'll need it. 
I stood dumbfounded as I watched my new boss, along with all of the other airport staff, leave. I started to wrap my head around the fact that I had an empty airport to myself for ten hours, with nothing to do and no one to deal with, all while I was getting paid the highest wage I had ever earned. As much as thinking about it delighted me, I turned my attention toward the sheet of paper I almost forgot I was holding on to. James said to follow whatever list was on it, so I figured I ought to take a look. I walked behind the airport counter and sank into one of the seats behind it. I took a sip of coffee and finally took a serious look. A total of six rules were neatly spaced on the sheet. Rule 1. All lights in the airport are to stay on at all times. If one is off, or if you are to accidentally turn one off, turn it back on as soon as possible. If a light seems to be broken or is out and unable to turn back on, calmly exit the area. Report the outage to James or maintenance when possible. Do not listen to the sounds. Do not listen to the voices. Rule 2. Rule 2 pertains to rainy or stormy weather. If it is raining or storming outside, disregard rules 3, 4, and 5. They will not be a concern during these types of weather conditions. Stay inside at all times. Do not use the men's restroom, and avoid going near it entirely if possible. Rule 3. Sometime between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m., a young woman will walk out of the woman's restroom. She will enter the terminal and sit, occasionally getting up to walk around or change seats. Her name is Elizabeth. She will attempt to make conversation, but you must not reciprocate. You may look at her. You may give nonverbal communication, such as a head nod. You may write as a means of communication, or you may shake her hand, but do not speak to her. If you refuse to speak to her, Elizabeth should be gone within a few hours. If you happen to make such a mistake, go to the men's restroom and wait for her to leave. Rule 4. At around 1 or 2 in the morning, a janitor in blue coveralls will arrive at the front entrance. Crack open the door and ask for his name. If he says his name is Simon, let him in. If he gives you any name other than Simon, shut the door and lock it without another word and walk away. If the janitor is Simon, he will attend to the janitorial needs of the airport. If he asks to clean where you are standing, oblige him. Simon will not interfere with your duties otherwise. He is not hostile or dangerous. You may engage in conversation with Simon. He will leave the same way he came when he feels it is necessary. Rule 5. At around 3 a.m., you may notice that a black and red Cessna Skyhawk has landed on one of the airstrips. You will never see it land and you will never see it take off. It will just appear when you're not looking. After spotting the plane for the first time, do not look at it again. Avoid looking in its general direction if at all possible. There is a picture of the exact plane displayed inside the terminal, behind the counter. Rule 6. Later in the night, but sometime before dawn, a group of men claiming to be from TSA may arrive at the airport. They will have their own key and let themselves in. Some could be armed. Often they exhibit panic behavior. They may search through the airport, sweep room to room and ask questions. They are permitted to search anywhere in the main airport building that they please, and you may oblige to any questioning, but under no circumstances are they permitted to enter the sky bridge. They will not enter without verbal approval, and they cannot harm you. After reading it over a few times, I set the laminated sheet down and leaned back further into my seat before taking a long sip of coffee, wondering what on earth I had just read. I hadn't taken James to be the imaginative type. Most of all, I hadn't taken him to be anywhere near the unprofessional type. Though, as I thought about it, it was unusual how rushed this all was, and how he left in such a hurry, leaving so few details. I began to wonder if I was being pranked. I considered that maybe this was all some sort of messed up joke or setup. I ruled that out pretty quickly. This was in fact a real airport. I had done plenty of research by the time I got here. At least a few real flights were coming in or going out each day. 
James had been working here for years, and I couldn't think of a reason why he would jeopardize his job or reputation just to get a scare out of me. After chuckling to myself at the absurdity of the situation, I decided to indulge and see what would happen. Maybe it was a test for me as a new employee. Maybe James wanted to see if I could follow orders. After glancing at the list once more and realizing the impact Rule 2 had on the number of things I would have to keep track of, I brought up my phone to check the forecast. Clear skies. Not a chance for rain or storms all night. Great, I thought to myself. I had to watch out for these Elizabeth and Simon characters to show up, and I suppose not be on the lookout for a random plane to appear on the runway. I stood up and grabbed my coffee, walking to the glass panes. I took another sip from my cup while admiring the lit runways along the airfield. It sure was a pretty nice sight. As I was raising my cup to finish what was left, I began to hear the click of shoes on the floor somewhere behind me. Startled, I spun around abruptly, dropping my cup and spilling the remainder of the coffee in the process. At the other end of the terminal seating stood a young woman, around her mid-twenties in my estimation. She was holding two large leather suitcases in each hand, and had an old-fashioned sense of style with a skirt and heels. Most surprising was her stunning beauty and welcoming smile. Oh, sorry dear, I didn't mean to scare you, she expressed with a sincere tone. I opened my mouth, ready to assure her that everything was fine, but I stopped myself. I recalled the list. At this point, I was certain that she was here at James' request a paid actor determined to make me break the rules. I was more determined not to. Instead, I simply fixed my posture, straightened my uniform, and looked back with a smile. She walked to the counter where she placed her leather suitcase on the ground before closing the distance between us. Looks like we've got this fabulous airport all to ourselves. I'm Elizabeth, she said, reaching out her hand. I shook it, but she didn't seem quite satisfied. And your name? I continued to smile and lock eye contact. Her grin grew for a moment before she remarked, You don't seem to be much of a talkative one. And with that, she turned and started to walk away. I returned to my seat behind the counter, watching her closely as I did. Elizabeth proceeded to the unattended airport shop, and after a couple of minutes of looking over magazine covers and occasionally taking a peek inside, she returned carrying a small stack of reading material. She approached my counter before placing a National Geographic magazine in front of me. I figured you might like this one. Enjoy, she said, winking before settling on a seat in the first row of the terminal, straight across from where I'd been sitting. Remarkably, her intuition was spot on. I may have lived in cities all my life, but I loved nature, despite how little of it I had gotten to see. National Geographic was a favorite of mine, one I had been familiar with and enjoyed on work breaks from time to time. Rarely was I given this long to be able to read. I was almost tempted to break the rule and thank her for her rather thoughtful act. Though I didn't. I stuck to the rule. The next couple of hours were uneventful. Elizabeth and I read through our magazines, occasionally looking up at each other to exchange glances and smiles. Within that time, she had attempted to get me to talk at least a half dozen more times. I almost gave in when she asked me if I wanted another magazine. At a little past 1.30, I could hear a knock at the front entrance. Elizabeth and I both looked before she remarked, Oh, that must be the nice cleaner man, with a giggle before returning to her magazine. I walked over to the front doors, and sure enough, there stood a man around his mid-thirties, sporting a blue janitor suit, waiting patiently at the door. I unlocked the door and opened it. As he took a stride to enter, I remembered the most important detail from Rule 4. I closed the door halfway and sternly commanded, Wait. The man looked up at me with a surprised look. What is your name? The man stared back at me as an innocent smile formed on his face. I'm Simon. Uh, the janitor here. Uh, did James tell you I was coming in tonight? I stood there for a moment, thinking over the rule, before nodding my head and opening the door once again to let him in. Once inside, Simon walked with purpose to the janitor's closet, 
which was positioned near the men's restroom. I followed him somewhat suspiciously for the next few minutes as he began to clean, but I eased up once I got the feeling that he was just the janitor around here, and that James made up the whole ask-for-his-name thing to make into one of his rules. I returned to my counter in the terminal and continued to read. Occasionally, Simon would pass by, off to do his duties in some part of the airport, or Elizabeth would stand up to look at the various pictures and paintings on display in the terminal. A good half an hour of this would go on before Simon approached the terminal counter with his mop in hand. He seemed to be eyeing up the two leather suitcases Elizabeth had set there. Assuming he wanted to clean where they were, I got up to move them. I grabbed each one by the handle, but failed to lift them off the ground. Confused, I stepped back to see they were stuck on something. They were not. Just two suitcases, left right where Elizabeth had set them. I tried to lift just one. Again, I failed. I tried both hands, putting my back and legs into it with all that I had. They wouldn't budge. I looked back up at Simon, who nodded his head in Elizabeth's direction. I turned to look at Elizabeth, who, after noticing my stare and my apparent inability to move her luggage, smiled and stood up. Let me get that for you, she insisted. With ease, she lifted both leather suitcases and moved them closer to her seat before lowering them, this time letting them drop a few inches. When they hit the ground, a boom echoed through the airport, and I flinched in surprise. I looked back at Simon, who hadn't seemed shocked at all. He just continued to mop. I slowly made my way back to my seat, not taking an eye off Elizabeth for one second as I did. After a few minutes, she looked back up from her magazine, noticed my stare, and returned to her reading with a grin. She seemed to find my shock amusing. Eventually, Simon noticed my surprise as well. He paused his mopping and approached me before raising his head. I know, I know. Stick to the rules. Everything will be fine. Trust me. He stated quietly. I nodded my head in response. Simon went back to his cleaning. A few minutes passed before Elizabeth had something new to say. What a remarkable aircraft, she exclaimed, looking out the glass panes facing the runway. I followed her gaze to the lone, black and red airplane positioned on the runway. I turned around, looking at the picture displayed behind me. It certainly looked like a match. I turned back to the window and felt my heart sink. A silhouette of a person now stood next to the plane, facing the airport and the windows of the terminal. Stop looking at it, Simon sternly muttered from behind me. I looked back at Simon, who quickly cowered, seemingly ashamed to have raised his voice at me but I was grateful he had. I read over Rule 5 again, specifically where it stated to not look at the plane twice. I murmured insults at myself under my breath, but they didn't have much room between my now heavy, frantic breathing. My eyes darted through the other rules. I chose to focus on that sheet of paper. At least it was something to look at other than that plane outside. This went on for a good ten minutes or so, and my breathing started to calm down. I had begun to pray in my head that whoever and whatever that was would go away when Elizabeth suddenly approached my counter. I snapped my head up in a jittery movement to make eye contact with her. I'm going to get some more reading material. Want another one of those? She asked, reaching a hand out to my National Geographic magazine. I looked up and nodded, forcing a smile. As she moved away, my gaze didn't and once again I found myself looking at the plane on the runway. The silhouette now standing hundreds of feet away from the plane, even closer to the building, and still staring in my direction. Chills ran up my spine as I snapped my gaze back to my desk. I began to shake with fear, and the manic breathing returned. Moments later, Elizabeth returned and placed a new magazine on the counter before running a hand over my shoulder seemingly to comfort me. Simon then put his hand on my back. He'll be gone soon, and so will the plane. Just don't look at it again, he assured me. Mind if I clean here? He then asked. I got up and walked to the end of the counter, 
watching Simon thoroughly clean the floor, before I looked up and let out a soft, Thank you. He nodded and smiled back. What was that? Elizabeth asked. I turned towards her. Oh, I was just thanking Simon for... My error occurred to me before I could finish speaking. My eyes locked on Elizabeth as she stood up from her seat and her smile faded. Her eyes and nose began to bleed profusely as she started to sob. Lightly at first, then hysterically. She let out a bellowing screech. A mix of pain and anger. She picked up one of her suitcases and hurled it at me. I barely dodged the ridiculously heavy object before it crashed into the wall behind me. Luckily, I was quick thinking this time and made a run for the men's restroom, recalling Rule 3. She chased after me, but I slammed the door shut in her face and locked it. Elizabeth pounded on the door with furious anger a few times, but gave up quickly. So that's how you dance, is it, love? I can play that game. She snickered before flipping a light switch outside the bathroom. The clicking of her shoes faded away. A few minutes of silence passed before laughter started to become audible from the other side of the door. One voice grew to two. Two voices grew to three. Three grew to ten. While others continued their now hysterical laughing, some began to scream. I crumpled to the floor, covering my ears as the voices went on only stopped by another flip of the switch. Light beamed through the bottom of the door. It's over now. She's gone. And so is the plane. I've got to be getting out of here soon, too. Simon's calm and friendly voice called out. I reluctantly exited the bathroom and followed him back to the counter, where he had prepared another coffee for me. I wish I could have done more there, but you'll come to find out that when Elizabeth gets angry... You just gotta let her do her thing. I looked up at him, still with my distraught face, at a loss for words. Over the next few minutes, Simon finished clearing Elizabeth's blood from the floor, before putting everything back into the janitor's closet. He looked down at his watch. I better get out of here. Good luck with the rest of your night. I hope I'll be seeing you soon. He said, letting out a sigh, as he again looked at me in pity. I think he knew how shaken up I was. It was like he had seen people in my position before. Something told me he doesn't have a choice on when he leaves. After I watched him exit the door, I returned to my seat behind the counter. I began to feel alone and afraid, but the loneliness wouldn't last, at least. Only minutes after Simon left, the door swung open, and men in tactical gear, most of which had their faces covered in masks and goggles, rushed through the door. I sprang back up from my seat and watched as they did, with not much else I could do. They swept room to room, checking every nook and cranny at gunpoint, ignoring my existence at first. As they cleared the entire building, the twenty or so armed men made their way to the terminal seating area. A lone man in a suit, whom I had not noticed before, made his way to the front of the group. I'm with TSA. I'm going to need you to answer a few questions for me, he demanded. I nodded in affirmation. How many individuals have you seen in this airport since the security team left the building? Besides myself? Two inside, one outside. I answered confidently. Was the individual outside next to a black and red Cessna Skyhawk? Yes. I again responded confidently. The man in the suit nodded and paused for a moment before making another demand. We are going to need to search the air bridge. I glanced back at the sheet of rules on the counter. Making sure I had read it right before... I took a step forward and straightened my uniform. No, I replied. The man in the suit looked irritated. If you do not step aside and give us permission to search, I'm afraid I'll have to detain you. Already tired and worn out, I wasn't going to break the last rule. I decided to give a not-so-smart remark to the man in the suit. Looking a little well-armed for TSA, wouldn't you agree? He ignored my comment. Last chance, step aside. No. Again, irritated by my response, the man in the suit turned to his right and raised his chin to give a signal. Gunshots rang out and I collapsed to the floor. I felt as though my life left my body before it all faded to black. The next thing I remembered was the feeling of my hand gripping a water bottle. Then came James's voice. 
I see you made it through the first night intact. Looks like you got to meet Simon. He's a nice guy. You'll get to like him. And Elizabeth, she's... Well, she's something else, isn't she? I opened my eyes and looked up at James. Am I dead? I asked in a raspy voice. James chuckled in return. No, no, you did great. You're fine. It does, however, look like you might have been a little assertive to our undead TSA Special Force wannabes. I would recommend sticking with the less aggressive tone and word choices. Maybe I ought to edit that into the rule sheet. In any case, they can't hurt you, but they can still get a jump out of you, as you saw. Once again, I was at a loss for words. I slowly made my way back to my feet from the ground and looked at the sunrise over the airfield. James held out an envelope for me. I opened it, revealing a stack of crisp $100 bills. A little bonus for your first night. It sure is a lot to go through for the first time, but I promise you get used to it all. I turned to James with an angry look and finally spoke up. What the hell is wrong with you? What makes you think it's okay to put someone through this without any warning? I'm done. Keep your damn money. I'm going to go call the cops. I started to walk towards the exit when James stepped in front of me. Look, I know it isn't fair for you, but it wasn't fair for me either. It wasn't fair for any of us. It's not okay, I know. But what do you expect me to do? Someone needs to be here for the night shift. You wouldn't believe any of this if I told you ahead of time. You would have thought I was some sort of nut job, and the police will think the same if you tell them. I needed you to see it for yourself. James was starting to get worked up and stopped to breathe before continuing. This money is yours. No strings attached. You're free to leave now and never come back. There will be no shame in it. I also started to calm down, but I couldn't bring myself to look James in the eye yet. If you choose to stay, I'll see you in my office to finish up your paperwork. And with that, James walked away. Facing the front of the airport, I watched the first few passengers of the day come through the entrance. I just stood there for a few minutes. Whether I was ready for this job or not, I knew right then I sure as hell wasn't going to go back to another overcrowded city airport. I turned and headed for James' office. Become a channel member today for early access, bonus videos, and special emojis only available to members. Check out the description below or click the join button for more info. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Sewall, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamakato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Blarian 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Bert Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Gary Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batiste, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabulavor, Raymond Jaggers, That Darn Fox, Raison Detra, Kai Gaming 99, Wendy Burns, The Wendigo, Michael Squishy Park, The Gemstar, Vault 77 Citizen, Puppy Dan, Clovis Wolf, Elder Jelm, Derek Prey, Elder Being, KC Hawaii, Rob T, Tragic Mermaid, Darren Fishnaller, Cloves and Oya Harris, Roe Underwood, Florida Man Luke, Bethany's Mom, Winter's Kiss, Sam Brook, The White Stag, Corgi Connection, No Name, Marta Cara, Professor Elm, Kathy Barrickman, Cybard Sands, Steve Hennessy, Melanie Sanders, The Archivist, Rob Smith, Term 4, Naz Razio, J. David Wellman Jr., Parker Lewis, Monica Moya, D Master 311, Britt the Alchemist, Taylor the Fox, Holly Howarth, Julia McWilliam, Lilypad, Serena and Jesse, Diego Rodriguez, Asiel Perez, Wolfcat128, Kamisha Coffin, Jen Scott, Avanza, and Lucien Haran Allen. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, as well as a Discord channel. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening, 
please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.